Oh, heavens no, not the green one. Pull anyone but the green one. The wire dilemma is something that we see in many movies. Which wire to cut? It adds a lot of tension to the movie. Hi GQ, I'm Paul Worsey, and I'm an explosives expert. If you want it to go boom, I'm your man. And this is the breakdown. Speed. Bypass the remote current with the battery. Can you find the tripwire for the remote? I don't know, I got a few choices here. Black and red. And green. The villain who planted this bomb was an ex-bomb squad expert. Howard Payne, Atlanta PD bomb squad. Retired in Sun Valley in 1989 when a small charge left him with fingers numbering nine. That's our scumbag! And this device is made so it's gonna be very, very difficult to disarm. And that's important because someone like myself could potentially be your worst nightmare. Basically, I can't go into any more detail, otherwise it's building a bomb 101. Because otherwise all these kids are listening and they're going, oh yeah, I could do that. <laughs> I want you to clip on the battery and then run it to the lead wire. Copy. I can't bypass, it'll fire! It's a collapsible circuit. Technically, you could have a dual circuit. Taking down one circuit would activate a backup circuit and cause it to blow up. And they now know their chances of diffusing it are slim, so they have to take a different approach entirely. Mac, I want you to get out of there and sit tight. We're gonna go after the source. Mac, get me out of here! That was right cool. It's a sophisticated device and it's in a terrible environment to work on. It's underneath a bus that's traveling at 50 mile an hour. That's really, really difficult. Working with this device, okay, in a lab or somewhere that's easy access is one thing. Under there, no way at all. And if you cut the power from it, it's got redundancy and a relay's gonna close and it's gonna go boom. The abyss. What we're looking at on the left-hand side is the detonating device. And as soon as he's taken that device out, now he's flooded the bomb with seawater, which is salty and conductive. So it's gonna stop it working in a heartbeat. Have you ever dropped a cell phone over the side of your boat once you've been at the seaside? Don't work anymore. In this clip, we have stripe wires and there are different colors. But with that uh, glow stick being green, it confuses what the actual colors are. Now there's some problems with this, and the first one is the way electricity works is you have to have two wires to make a circuit. So that really doesn't matter which wire he cuts, it will break the circuit. If you're ever in this situation, I'd recommend cutting both the wires at the same time. Mission Impossible 3, lots of great effects in this film. So one of the items on this movie is spray-on explosive foam. It actually exists. It was developed for clearing minefields, but the guy who was developing it uh, used it on a minefield in the Falklands and uh, accidentally blew himself up. And I suspect what happened, it was something like a bouncing Betty where you have these little spikes sticking up. And while he was spraying the, the foam on it, the foam pushed the spike over, the setting off the mine. The way it works is you spray on the foam, you stick a blasting cap in and fire it. And this foam itself has loads of little bubbles of air or gas in it, which actually helps sensitize it. Ethan, get out of the truck! 
One of the things I noticed was the drone that was used in the movie was firing missiles. It's more likely it's going to be dropping guided bombs. All of the weight of the device, okay, can be the frag and the explosive, plus of course you've got a guidance package on it. If we look, however, at a missile, most of it's going to be the actual rocket propelling it. However, missiles can be fired very, very quickly and guided to their target as well. I like the guided missile impacting the SUV and causing a huge explosion. But the one problem with it is Tom Cruise is blown sideways. Now, if that had been real, he'd have been blown forwards, not sideways. He'd be blown directly away from the explosion. Tom Cruise likes to do all his own stunts, but with that hit into the side of that car, I'd have preferred to have a stuntman do it for me. Naked Gun, two and a half. One of my all-time favorite comedies. What are you gonna do? 15 seconds. Oh. Jane, I got my sleeve. Oh, no. And nine, eight, I can't seven, get it. seven, Jane, my gosh. Okay. Five, four, three, uh. two. Let's get out of here. One. <laughs> If you take the power away from something, it stops working. And, you know, when, you, when you're defusing something, if you can cut that power uh, source, okay, it's not going to function. You've got a computer that runs on clockwork and talks at the same time. 20 seconds to detonation. <laughs> This is a fantastic spoof of Goldfinger. In Goldfinger, Sean Connery is looking at the countdown, not knowing what to touch, what to try and rip apart, and all of a sudden the expert appears over his shoulder and turns the off switch. Turning the off switch kills the power. It's as simple as that. Every electrically initiated bomb needs a power source. Now, usually you use a battery, but in this case, it's plugged into the wall socket. So, accidentally pulling out the plug takes away the power and everything stops and the bomb's killed. The significance of a countdown timer is that it gives you time to get away from a bomb if you flip the switch manually. So having a countdown timer is important because you get this visual clue that it's actually working. In real life, the guy who uh, built this device probably wouldn't put it such front and center. However, for the camera, it's important to get that good camera angle. If you can't defuse the bomb, you may be able to relocate it. So let's look at an example of that. The Dark Knight Rises. What are you doing? I can get it out over the bay. Set it to fly out over the water that eject? No autopilot. He knows he can't defuse the bomb, so his only option is to get it as far away from the city as possible. To protect the city, he needs to get several miles away from it before it detonates, depending on the yield of the device, and that's the question. It appears he didn't have quite enough time to do that, to get it far enough away. However, the actual nuclear explosion is way in the distance, almost over the horizon, so that puts it at probably seven miles plus. The flash is fairly realistic, okay, but the after effects one still would expect some significant movement of air there in the city it'd be noticeable. Also a fairly big explosion, a big boom to go along with it. The best film that I've seen uh, portraying a nuclear device and explosion is in True Lies. And I think they really got it spot on, even to the individual Merv warhead. And then the question comes, would he survive? I think so, landing in the water, that's gonna give him pretty good protection as long as he jumped out as soon as he got over the water. 
the explosion's about to go off and you're within range. Let's talk about taking cover. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Do not remove goggles or face first until 10 seconds after first light. Oh, that can't be good at all. In the United States, we've had around 800 nuclear weapons tests between the Nevada test site and also White Sands. In some of these tests, especially early on, they put out cities and arrays of buildings and things like that to actually test to see what the effect of a nuclear weapon was on these various distances, both close in and far away, to determine exactly what effects that happen, how far away from that blast. A nice little touch they have on the film is that when you see him open the door of the refrigerator, it's got a label on it that says lead lined. They used to use lead for all sorts of things back then. <laughs> Refrigerators are extremely sturdy. That lead gives you quite a lot of protection from a radiation burst. Some of the older folks will remember having to get under a desk at school in nuclear drills. And what happens in a nuclear explosion is around five PSI of pressure will absolutely rip a house apart. Whereas humans, if you're really lucky, can last up to somewhere near 200 PSI, except you're not gonna be in very good shape over 100 PSI. So it's not the pressure of the explosion that's gonna get you if you're in a house, it's probably the house falling on you. The other thing about uh, being inside something that's substantial is that the blast wave as it comes in is gonna reflect off that and we have a thing called the impedance mismatch equation. What happens is you get very little transmitted from a low density material like air to a higher density. And then with all those planes inside that until you get to the inside the refrigerator, that's gonna soak up a lot of that blast energy. It's almost like having your own mobile blast shelter. The question is, would that explosion send that refrigerator that far? And probably the answer's no. Indy took quite a hit when that refrigerator landed. I don't know whether you could survive that because that was pretty hard landing. Fortunately for him, it broke the lock on the refrigerator. And that used to be in a problem in the old days because kids are getting refrigerators and get locked in them. So being in that refrigerator, as long as he's far enough away from the blast, he'd survive it. But the impact when it landed, yeah, probably wouldn't survive that. <laughs> Well, did he do the right thing taking the refrigerator? Well, maybe he should have looked for the basement. So the footage is really very realistic. Uh, when you see those mannequins start to melt, okay, that would be caused by the intense light and heat, specifically in the infrared region. Of course, light travels very, very quickly. It's almost instantaneously the speed of light. Now, if we count, how many seconds it is between that flash of light to the shock wave hitting the buildings and starting to rip them apart, we can estimate roughly how far that explosion was from the town. And we do that by using approximately 1,000 feet per second of delay. Let's count it, shall we? Let's run it again and count it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006. Okay, five seconds. It's about the right distance what I'd expect to put a town out there. A shock wave's gonna go faster than the speed of sound, so that would put it in somewhere around one mile from where the actual nuclear weapon detonated to the location of the, the town. The actual buildings coming apart looks very accurate. Basically, during the explosion, you get this huge shock wave and air pushed in front of it, and that causes those buildings to lean. In all the old 
nuclear weapons test photographs and cine film, you can actually see those buildings lean away from the explosion and then when there's a vacuum and it sucks all the air back in, it really rocks the buildings and trees the other way and oftentimes sucks them off their foundations. The Hurt Locker. Butcher shop, two o'clock, dude has a phone. Why is Eldridge running? Make you put it down! Put down the phone! Come on, guys, talk to me. Drop the phone! Drop your Shit. phone! Hey. The significance of the cell phone is that typically in Iraq, these bombs were actually actuated by a second cell phone incorporated into the device. Run I can't get a shot! <laughs> The explosion goes off and the question is, does he get far enough away and is this realistic? In the movies, it's very, very difficult to show a shockwave in the air unless you actually do it. Now, I could have done this, but uh, you know, the uh, health and safety people would have not been too happy about it. The question is, does the shockwave get him or is it fragged from that explosion? I think he's far enough away from the blast there to get away from the shockwave. I think he would have survived the shockwave, but if anything got him, it was most likely the frag from the device. And usually in these IEDs in Iraq, they used actual ordnance, shells and things like that and projectiles okay and then prime them initiated those and that not only gave blast but also gave a lot of tiny metal particles flying through the air up to about two kilometers a second that's nearly as fast as most speeding bullets it's a brilliant effect with the actual blood starting to splatter on the front of his visor from inside the way i would see it probably took some frag to the head. I think for the individual character, all these things are great things to write into a movie, give all these little nuances to give the audience an idea of, of what it's actually like. Now, in reality, the kind of person uh, who's gonna be an EOD specialist is gonna be dogged at, at reaching their goal and achievement. This is because EOD school okay is very tough there's a lot of perseverance a lot of ability to remember things and just pure doggedness to get through this sort of thing often get asked about explosions in films and the question always is was that realistic to real life unfortunately the answer is no explosions in real life look very drab uh, on the whole. In this explosion, there's a number of items that actually go off, debris being thrown everywhere into the air. And then afterwards, there's a, a fireball that's set off. A lot of extra things can be put in, in films, in special effects. That really makes the explosion look absolutely fabulous. The long kiss, good night. Ready? Yeah. Hey. There's no way out! My first impression was that grenade laid there so long, it must have been a dud, because <laughs> it took way too long to go off. Hey, now the second thing is uh, how far that fireball went. That was just incredulous. So the grenade we see there in the picture is a, a more modern type of grenade. In the old days, they used to have pineapple grenades that actually looked like a pineapple with big chunky segments on them. 
The old pineapple grenades cause chunks to fly out, uh, and these chunks hit people and kill them. Whereas the modern grenade is uh, designed to wound people rather than kill them, and uh, they generally wire around. When the grenade, the high explosive charge goes off, it rips that wire into lots of little pieces, and that shreds everything. Pretty nasty devices. When a normal grenade goes off, it's like a white puff and there's frag going everywhere, and it's it's pretty bad news. There isn't a big fireball like that, and that's obviously a special effect for the audience. However, there are some grenades that do actually catch on fire. Those are known as phosphorus grenades, and in fact, some of those were used in the Falklands War, okay, by the British troops to clear trenches. Phosphorus burns and it's pretty nasty, okay, so it's a crispy crit at times with that stuff. The actual color of the light would be different if I want to talk about it technically. This one really looks like a fuel explosion rather than a phosphorus burning. If that was a phosphorus grenade, their backs would be on fire before they got out of the uh, window. But of course, going into the icy cold water would probably extinguish it. The Hurt Locker. Oh God. The type of bomb this is, is a VBIED, which is a vehicle-borne IED, which is an improvised explosive device. And basically, if we use a vehicle, we can take a lot of explosives somewhere rather than just something the weight of a backpack. Okay, let's pause here. The key here is the windshield wipers. It's an arid environment, so you're not gonna use them except to maybe clear a bit of dust off the windshield. That is one of the possible locations you could attach an explosive device to electrically. There's obviously something wrong with this IED because with those windshield wipers going backwards and forwards, it should have gone off. What the hell is he doing? I don't know what the fuck he's doing. Looks like he's checking the oil. Now he has a good idea what's going on, and he opens the hood and he's looking for wires. The easiest place to connect something to is to the battery for power. So he grabs hold of this wire that's connected to the battery that shouldn't be there and rips it out. Next, he looks for the arming switch for the bomb which if you're gonna be driving a VBIED, you're gonna have within reach of the driver. He locates that and then he looks for the relay that then sets the bomb off. And he actually rips that out to disable it. We're done. It's not like you're dealing directly with explosives, you're dealing with electrical wires. So what he did was just rip that out, just like pulling out the plug from a socket in the wall. The term IED, improvised explosive device, is what we used to use in the old days for anything we made. In fact, the FBI told me not to use the word bomb because of the connotations. And being in research, and everything we built was an improvised explosive device. Of course, these days, it has a completely different connotation, worse than the bomb. Get out of here. We've seen cutting wires, ticking time bombs, and running away from the explosion. This one's got it all, baby. Lethal weapon three. Relax, Roger, relax. I swear to Raj, we got nine minutes and seven seconds left. Hey, you know what we could do? You know what we could do? What? We could drive this thing out of here. Hey, five, it's your turn to drive. Oh, shit, no keys. I can hotwire it. <gasps> don't, don't even say hotwire on this stuff, man. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're Why right. am I doing this? Why am I... Looks like we're gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may say that that's a mess of wires out there. But actually, what we're looking at, they're green and yellow twisted, and they're the actual detonator wires to each one of those detonators, which is poked into an individual block of explosives. Now, usually the detonators have two wires coming out of them that are separated, but I guess you could twist them together 
okay, to make it less of a mess. With all those detonators there, the easy solution to this one is to snip those wires one by one right where they go into the detonator and then pull out that detonator plastic cap and throw it away. At that point, you can start disassembling all the rest of the explosives, okay, if you can get to every single one of those detonators. In fact, probably looking at it, you could just pull them out if you couldn't reach them properly and then snip them off. You ready? I'm cutting the wire. Snip. See, all done. So Mel cuts the red wire and all of a sudden that clock starts speeding up. The question is, would that happen in reality? Well, hey, this is the movies. What can I say? Probably not, but I think at a stretch, if you set it out to be that way as a kind of booby trap, where if somebody started messing with it, it started counting down quicker and then they knew, heck, we have gotta get the hell out of here because otherwise we're toast. That could be a plausible explanation. So Mel snips the red wire and then the clock starts speeding up fantastically. And the question is, can they get out of there in that a short time period? Raj. Yeah. Grab the cat. Grab the cat. Get back! Take that! Most people can't run 100 yards in 10 seconds. So they've only got a few seconds there, so they're gonna be pretty close when it goes off. But there's really not that much explosive there. And yeah, I think you could outrun it. When that explosive went off, in reality, it would make a different kind of effect. It would be a shock wave and blow dust off everything and, and kind of look whitish uh, in, in color. Not as spectacular. Now, this is the movies, and what you have there is fireballs. You're seeing gasoline being blown into the air and ignited to give the effect. And uh, that's quite different. The building itself was brought down by controlled demolition using explosive charges. And that was separate and occurred a few seconds after the main fireball in the building. They would have first had the fireball at the front as they ran out, pull everybody back uh, to fire the main one where there's fireballs and everything coming out, all the windows and debris and everything. And you'll notice about five seconds after that, the whole building starts to drop. Thanks for watching these clips with me. I hope you've learned a lot and until next time.